Well, a major way to test any worldview, philosophy, or theory is to ask, is it logically consistent? Is it internally coherent? And that means that you have to take that worldview and what does it say about the nature of truth or knowledge? In other words, what's its epistemology? And then apply it to itself. It has to fit its own standards. For example, there's a theory called evolutionary epistemology. It's a naturalistic approach that applies evolution to the theory of knowledge. And it proposes that the human mind is a product of natural selection so that the ideas in our mind are not selected for the truth value, but for their survival value. In other words, we human beings in the process of evolution picked up certain ideas because they helped us to master the environment and survive better. Fine, what if we apply that theory to itself? Well, then it was selected not for its truth value, but for its survival value, which discredits its own claim. There's one apologist named Greg Kokel who says this is how a theory commits suicide when it takes its own standard of truth and applies it to itself, it discredits itself. It shoots itself in the foot, it slits its own throat. It discredits its own view. So it's amazing to me that there are many leading thinkers who have actually embraced that theory without detecting the way it commits suicide. There's a philosopher named John Gray, British philosopher, who once said, listen to this quote and see if you can detect the contradiction. He said, if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, then the human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. It's astonishing to me that he doesn't catch that. In other words, he said, if Darwin's theory is true, then it's not true. This is kind of like the liar's paradox. You know, this statement is a lie. If the statement is true, then as it says, it's not true. It's a lie. And so this is one of the standard tools in any philosophical toolbox for testing ideas. The technical term for it is self-referential absurdity, meaning that when it applies its own definition of truth to itself, it undercuts itself. Nancy, didn't Darwin himself wonder if an evolutionary account of the human mind undercut his ability to trust what he believes and thereby undercut his ability to believe that evolution is true. Well, that's often thought to be the case, but it's not quite true. People often use a quote from Darwin, it's become famous, in which he talks about his quote-unquote horrid doubt. He says, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed in the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. So clearly what he's saying is, if the human mind developed by natural selection from the mind of the lower animals, then I don't think we can trust it. But of course, his own theory was just one of those convictions of the human mind that he was talking about. So why would it be at all trustworthy? But the surprising thing is that Darwin never actually confronted this internal contradiction in his theory. And the reason is that he expressed his horrid doubt selectively. He expressed it only when he was considering the case for a creator. And you have to go back, you know, behind the pull quotes. You have to go back and look at the context in order to see this. For example, there were many times when Darwin admitted, even later in life, that he still found the idea of God persuasive. And in one case, for example, in a personal letter, he said, I have an inward conviction that the universe is not the result of chance. Now, it was exactly in that context, in fact, the very next sentence that he expressed his horrid doubt. So the conviction that he was mistrusting was his lingering conviction that the universe is not the result of chance and that there might be a God after all. And there's another example. He said, Darwin, again, in his own writing said, I feel compelled to look to a first cause, having an intelligent mind, in some degree analogous to that of man. And again, this is another expression of his skepticism. He says, but then arises the doubt. Can the mind of man, which has, as I fully believe, been developed from a mind as low as that possessed by the lowest animal, be trusted when it draws such grand conclusions? In other words, he was asking, can it be trusted when it draws grand conclusions about a first cause? In fact, he goes on in that context to say, maybe the concept of God is just an instinct programmed into us by natural selection, like a monkey's instinctive fear of the snake. So if you look at the context, 
It's only when Darwin's mind led him to the conclusion that there might be a God that he dismissed the human mind as untrustworthy. And he never really saw through it and realized that if he was going to be logically consistent, he needed to apply the same skepticism to his own theory. And his followers have done the same thing. Stephen Jay Gould, same thing. He said, Darwin showed us the idea of God is just the result of our neuronal complexity. In other words, the, the idea of God appears in the human mind when the electrical circuitry of the brain has evolved to a certain level of complexity. But of course, to be consistent, he would have to apply that same skepticism to Darwin's ideas. So the upshot is that many, many evolutionists will use their skepticism against Christianity for the ideas they don't like, but they fail to see that once they adopt that form of skepticism, they have to apply it to their own theory as well. That only the person who affirms a rational creator of the universe has a basis for trusting human rationality. I really like how you use the term selective skepticism in your book, Nancy, because that's exactly, as you just said, what's going on here. And I think you also correctly say that many of Darwin's followers have used the same kind of selective skepticism. Basically, our minds work fine, except for when we're believing in God or we're doubting evolution. I mean, Richard Dawkins views religion as a misfiring of neural modules. And he compares falling in love with God to a moth flying to a flame. Basically, our brains have the ability to believe certain things, but when we believe in God, then our minds are sort of not working properly. And that's the evolutionary history coming into play, where evolution didn't build our brains to find the truth, but that just to survive. And of course, conveniently, whenever your brain believes in God, then it's not finding the truth, uh, according to them. It's simply just using whatever evolutionary tools it has to survive. It just seems like such a contrived argument to try to make atheism look like the logical conclusion when your brain is working properly, and theism when your brain is sort of working improperly. But why couldn't it be the other way around? I mean, do these people ever have the self-reflection to see that their argument could be turned against them as well? It should be. I mean, it's not that it can be turned against them, but it's if you're going to have a logically coherent system of thought, then whatever you lay out as your theory of knowledge, you have to apply it to your own theory as well. Otherwise, you don't have a coherent system. And an incoherent system is by definition false. You, if you have a logical contradiction, if you say the circle is a square, if you contain a logical contradiction, by definition, your view fails. And so it's absolutely imperative that once you set up a definition of truth, knowledge, a definition of epistemology, it has to apply that to your own view as well. And this is why, like I say, a theistic worldview doesn't have this problem. A theistic worldview can have a high view of human rationality because the human mind is made in the image of God. Our minds reflect the divine mind. So in one sense, what's happening here is the secular person, the evolutionist, has to reach over and borrow a Christian view of reason to support his own case. Right? So he undermines and discredits reason on one hand by saying our minds have evolved by unguided natural forces. There's no reason that our minds would be selective for truth. After all, false ideas work well for survival as well sometimes. Steven Pinker, a well-known evolutionist, says our brains were shaped for fitness, not truth. And sometimes the truth is adaptive, sometimes it's not. And that's a direct quote. Another one is Eric Baum, who says, sometimes you're more likely to survive and propagate if you believe a falsehood than if you believe the truth. So the pressure for sheer survival you know, might sometimes produce some correct ideas, right? So a zebra who thinks lions are friendly is not going to live very long. But false ideas can also be useful for survival. And the upshot is that survival is no guarantee of truth. So if survival is your only standard, you can never know which ideas are true and which are adaptive but false. In fact, to make the dilemma even more puzzling, evolutionists tell us that natural selection has, in fact, produced all sorts of false concepts in the human mind. For example, many will tell us that free will is an illusion. We are just complex biochemical machines. There's no such thing as free will. There's no such thing as mind. There is no unified self. In fact, in the most extreme cases, they will say consciousness is an illusion because the mind is just a computer and computers work without consciousness. 
So all of these ideas that you and I hold, that the vast majority of the human race holds, are said to be false. So if survival is your only mechanism for acquiring knowledge, and survival, your own theory acknowledges, often produces false ideas, then you have no basis for claiming truth for any theory, including your own. That's the key, that once you set up a definition of knowledge, it has to apply to your own view. So how in the world do you then avoid committing suicide? How do you avoid, in fact, discrediting your own view? Well, you exempt yourself. You exempt yourself, at least temporarily, from your own epistemology. You essentially have to reach over and take a theistic notion of reason, that reason and rationality are reliable, because we're made in God's image. You have to borrow the biblical view of reason, at least while you're making your own case. And so this is the irony. Either your worldview, if you're an evolutionist and adopt evolutionary epistemology, either your worldview collapses internally, and, that, and of course that, that discredits it, or you have to make an exemption for yourself and borrow a biblical view of reason in order to support your theory, which of course is also a contradiction. So either way, you contain a fatal contradiction and the theory fails.